Today on the show, we have a very special guest. We have someone who's been a, not a professor, but a teacher, an instructor, a lecturer in uh, in many universities in the Chicago area. He's a professional. He does radio. He does theater. He does voice acting. He does audiobooks and so much more. We have today one of the stars, literally one of the stars of Mass Effect Andromeda, the voice of Scott Ryder, Mr. Tom Taylorson. Welcome to the show. Now, I've known your work for quite a while, and uh, I will say the first game that I believe um i fully recognized your name in was a little wee shooter which for me was one of the best known as the conduit oh thank you yeah that was um that was a great one i almost i almost did uh, the conduit too uh the the sequel almost 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 i know when it came to the sequel they had to change a lot if not all the voice cast but i know they replaced uh, the main characters um voice from uh, shepherd to uh one of our favorites um john st john you know duke nukem and uh they also made it a lot nuttier, which for me was awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was one of those situations where um, I was a, a good relationship with all the folks over at High Voltage and their sound, their, their, their audio lead, of course. And uh, he kind of got in touch with me and said, hey, I'm just reaching out to you because I got your email address. We can always go through your agent or whatever. Could you send me some auditions for this? Um, we're putting together, like we're almost at content lockdown and we're putting everything together. And I kind of, I'm not happy with our lead but I think you could do it. <laughs> could you do some stuff? So I sent some auditions off and he's like, this is awesome. I'm going to present it. And then like a week or more went by and I checked in. I said, Hey, anything come with it? You know, I'm um, just cause you know, stuff's going on. He says, Oh man, we were too close to lockdown. We couldn't do it, you know, time and budget. So we're going forward with this stuff. Thank you though. So, you know, that happens. It was really cool to work on. And a lot of the other actors in the game uh, were, uh, voice and uh, theater actors from in Chicago that I worked with uh, who are also wonderful. Yeah, Danny Goldring and uh, others like that. It's just wonderful, wonderful people. So It seems like with a game like Conduit that it's just, it was, it'd be a lot of fun to voice. And we've had uh, John St. John on, of course, Duke Nukem, and he's the, the lead in the second one. And, you know, with him, if you get him, you know the type of dialogue you can get, the type of stilted, cheesy sci-fi fun. And this fit exactly in there. And I think that's one reason why I really liked it because and knew exactly what it was and ran with it and uh i love that yeah yeah and and for me it was like okay you're this conspiracy theory radio guy okay we do this and they reference this and then like okay how about these aliens and i just came up with some weird stuff because they just you know they, they give you a picture and you go and that was a lot of fun to invent and play with uh oh yeah it was it was a great time great time working with that team Wait, so they actually gave you the freedom to create that voice? Because I know usually they just give you an instruction and say, do this, but they actually let you do the creation for this one? Yeah, because they, the, they had their alien language that was all created. They knew what they wanted, but they didn't know what it would sound like. And so I sent them a couple different versions, you know, based on the pictures that I saw. Um, and they chose what they chose and then kind of, you know, pitched it and put some flange on it and whatnot. And it kind of wound up, you know, blanding it a little bit, you know what I mean, to make it sound kind of like, you know, what other what other games were doing at the same, at the time, you know, like Halo, but it was like, yeah, it still works, it still comes off, and, uh, and like I said, it was, it was an absolute blast to work on. If I recall right, High Voltage is in Chicago, so did you actually get to record this game in Chicago itself? Yeah, yeah, they're based off in the Hoffman Estates, out just outside the city. Um, yeah, and so that was another great thing, is that there were, there were game companies in Chicago then, <laughs> um, and then, and then there weren't, uh, mid two thousands to late two thousands there, the aughts there weren't. And now there are game companies coming back, but they're all with like one or two exceptions like, uh, uh galaxy, uh, what's up? I'm, uh, oh, I'm forgetting their name, but other than like one or two bigger places, they're all like small indies. Uh, which is really cool. There's a lot of amazing stuff uh, coming out of the uh, indie video game scene in Chicago right now. So I know you teach and lecture and so on in universities. So as a professor, how have your students uh, reacted to your, you know, your various roles when you get them, and uh, have they ever approached you with it? Well, 
No, the hmm, so I wasn't a professor. That requires like degrees and things. A, a adjunct faculty. Okay. So basically, somebody. Um, Columbia College does a lot of great stuff where they have their their professors and professionals there uh, who you know do a lot of the, who aren't just you know uh, uh, instructors and lecturers. But then they handle a lot of the administrative duties and things like that within the department. But then to fill out a lot of their, a lot of their classes, they bring in professionals from in and around Chicago. So when you take that radio class or you take that, you know, editing class for video, audio, whatever it is, that that instructor many times is a working professional. They come in to do that couple hour class or whatever, but then they are doing what they are teaching you. The rest of the week and that's something very special about columbia college and they're very particular about that and some of the other universities in the area within chicago because they have access to that community do that as well so uh for the for the like the voice acting classes at depaul they bring in a friend of mine deb dotzer to teach there who also teaches as adjunct faculty at uh, columbia college so um there i was just adjunct teaching voiceover and um you know, at that point, like, most everybody had not played anything that I'd been in. And a few students knew about, um, knew about Octodad as an indie and then as it came out, things like that. But most of the stuff that I had done after that point because of their age, too, like um, uh, Mortal Kombat, Armageddon, they hadn't played that. You know, these, some of these guys, you know, were like 10. <laughs> when Mortal Kombat Armageddon came out. So they didn't play uh, MK Armageddon and some other stuff that I'd worked on. They didn't play uh, Dao Fang because they were, you know, five when that came out. So, you know, a lot of what I had to offer was just the random stuff and, that, you know, that resume and other things that I'd worked on. And then some of my contacts. Uh, and I knew, you know, Steve Downs, who's Master Chief. And it's like, I, can I get Steve to come in and visit the class? I think the kids would get a kick out of that. And so um, um, the uh, department head, she's like, oh, yeah, I can get Steve because we all know Steve. You know, he was a he's a radio DJ and he did a theater in the area. And um, so we just have him into the class and the students are going kind of crazy. Like, oh, my gosh, it's Master Chief, you know, and I'm talking to him. It was a lot, a lot of fun. And then I, of course, got something signed by him, too. And he looks at me funny. What are you doing? And I said to him. Well, and he goes, oh, right, you're one of them. All right, hold on. <laughs> it sucked it. Um, yeah, uh, so a lot of it was just, and I, I plugged it this way. It's like, look, you know, you're going to get a lot of instructors in, in throughout your life who are at a certain point in their career where they've either done the things and they're bringing that experience or they're, they're just at a certain point in their career where they bring that kind of, you know, uh, luggage of work and they go here it is and they open it up and, and they share and i said you know that that's awesome and i appreciate that and you guys should too i said that's not what i bring i bring somebody who's out here yelling and kicking and stream and screaming trying to make all of this stuff work and so i bring that experience day to day to you my students you know the experience of somebody out there scrambling to make ends meet and you know not doing a half bad job at it you know, so as I learned stuff, I would bring that immediately to class. You know, I would come off of a session for something and I say, hey, I learned something today or I worked with this person today and I gleaned this and I'm able to kind of share that information in real time. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And it's funny you mentioned Octodad because I, I believe, if I recall right, that is where you met Frida Wolf, who, of course, was your twin sister and you know, fellow lead in Mass Effect Andromeda. Yeah, yeah, we did. She was working out here in L.A. and worked remotely with the uh, the team at Young Horses, who did Octo who created Octodad. And so we just knew each other online before we ever met in person out here in Los Angeles. Nice. And of course, a lot of people now know you for Mass Effect Andromeda. We play one of the leads. And one thing I've always wondered is, um, since you and Frida play siblings, did they ever do any sort of audition with you guys? Uh, you know, together to, to test out the, the chemistry? Mm, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, when once we were cast and worked and, and working on it, they had no idea we knew each other or had any kind of relationship whatsoever. And so that uh, that sibling rivalry video that, that, they, that they did as a promo, you know, early in the year, 
this year. They kind of invented that when they realized, kind of following us on Twitter, they went, we should do something with these two. They know each other. You know, it's not often that we have anybody in our casts that know each other, know each other, and could possibly, you know, work together in this respect. Uh, they they bandied about the idea of possibly recording the two of us at the same time. You know, those sequences when the siblings wake up, wake one or the other up. It, it, but it never worked out timing-wise. Um, but that was bandied about. So, yeah, there was there was no plan or anything. We were I was cast in August of 2015, and then she was cast, I believe, in September. So then how long did it take before you two actually realized you're working on the same game together? It was... Ah, gosh, it was in September. I want to say, you know, we had the job and I had a couple sessions at all. And it was one of those situations where she was finishing something off and she was at that point living way out of the city and she was on her way home and we were just talking on the phone and um, because she's like, I'm driving home. How are you? I just moved to Los Angeles like three months prior. So she's just checking in. And, I, and it was one of those things where we kind of played a game when I said, uh, yeah, I'm going to be working down at, uh, at uh, Formosa uh, you know, tomorrow. She says, hmm, I just finished off something at Formosa. Hmm. And she says, let's play a game. Let's play. Are we working on the same game game? Okay. Are you be?" And I'm like, okay, are you being directed from Canada? She says, yes. And then she says, is your game a long running science fiction series? And I said, yes. She says, okay, we'll work on the same game. Good, good, good. And we just let it sit at that. And we're just talking about some other stuff and working things. And then she says it was me and my version of the story. I'm, just, I'm, I'm set. I'm, I'm set that there's different versions of this out there. And that's fine. But it boils down to one of us saying, okay, okay, this is, this is ridiculous. I, I can't deal with this. Can you keep a secret? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I can keep a secret. What's up? I am the player character in the next Mass Effect game. To which I respond, or she responds again, depending on who's telling it. Okay. Can you keep a secret? I'm the player character in the next Mass Effect game. And we realized exactly what had happened. You know, I'm, I'm the male character. She's the female version. And it was just another fi about 15 minutes of us just going, shut up to one another. Be again, because of years of Octodad and all this other stuff. It was just complete and utter uh, amazing happenstance. Frida came up with a great code word if we were ever discussing it outside and about. You know, we referred to it as burrito. How was burrito today? It was good. Are you going in for burrito today? Yes, I am. Are you going in? Yes. Okay, we'll see you in the trans. You know, there's one of us would go in the morning, the other one would record in the afternoon. Um, and that was actually great because it was the first thing that I booked after moving to Los Angeles. And to have that big thing and that very long process, you know, I'd never worked on something this extensive, uh, extensively before. And so to be able to share that with somebody rather than having, you know, a year and a half of not saying anything was wonderful. Yeah, we know the secrecy among uh, Bioware games. We're talking to lots of other of the Mass Effect uh, voice casts from previous games. And I imagine this must have relieved a lot of pressure for you because I think the only other one I know of that could talk was like Mark Mir with his wife, Melinda Cornish, because they're both in basically all the Bioware games. But, uh, you know, this must have been very helpful because I don't think they announced the cast until like January of this year, right? They started releasing the general cast, but we got messages from uh, Caroline Livingstone, their uh, voice director and uh, just all around awesome person who works with us though up there um and she's like we're gonna drop your names specifically on n7 day like, okay yes. you know so we were announced and they were like we're gonna be trickling out the rest of the cast as as time goes on and so they were setting up videos and whatnot for some of the other cast members and then just dropping names as, as things would happen and that way they can you know kind of keep that little steady flow of information and then also prepare some of us it's like okay your twitter feed's about to explode you know things like that they they had a they had experience with what happens. Yeah, and I imagine it, it definitely helped to have uh, Jennifer Hale and so on do the, the little intro video to announce in the game. And then, you know, for me, I, I love Mass Effect and Drama. I, I, it resonated with me in ways that uh, a lot of the other ones didn't. And um, I, I liked it uh, before they fixed the animations and so on. But, you know, I understand how that happened. You know, it's, uh, it's what happens when you use a f an in-game engine you're not familiar with and not given the resources to learn. But for me, it was a fantastic game. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you've you've probably read the Kotaku article. I've also yeah. read the article. And so there's there was like inside or base there's inside baseball there that I didn't know about. And there was things in that article I went, okay, I can see where that happened or how that happened. And you know, welcome to 
man, welcome to game development, you know? And there's just some stuff that people are not going to be happy with. There's all sorts of things that's going on. And the, the only thing we can do is the, the best at our job that we possibly can. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. And there are a lot of people out there that are enjoying the living daylights out of the game. And I absolutely uh, adore that. I, I love it uh, because we did, you know, we did put a lot of love into that into that thing and we still really care about the you know the the game and mass effect and the universe and these characters and the people that we worked with we love it i'm just glad people are enjoying it we were happy to share it i know from previous games from uh, a lot of the leads and so on because it is the rules when it comes to recording that they re you recorded other characters but from what i hear from frida and jules and so on that you guys because there were so many lines you pretty much just recorded your one character and didn't play anything else yeah I, that because I said, hey, am I, are we going to do other stuff? And they said, yeah, we might later on. Never, never happened. There was always, you know, there was always like just four hours worth of stuff that we needed to crank through, you know, especially at the end. You know, we figured we'd be called in to do something at the end to, you know, flush out this one random NPC or something like that. And it never, yeah, it never happened because, like, like I said, we just always had enough to do each time. Of course, though, the cast for this is, is huge, and you guys got to add even more uh, with uh, that Calling Out Explorers contest, where I know you guys got to interact a bit with the, uh, with the two winners of the, of the contest. You got to voice uh, multiple characters in the games. Yeah. Oh, that was wonderful. That was our, that was our last day of recording. Uh, Reed and I both had some stuff to pick up, and Danielle Rain, who plays uh, Vetra, was there. That was the first time I met her. So we all knocked out all of our stuff. And, um, and then, yeah. They, they came in and they, they killed it. They were, they were wonderful. Um, constantly surprising us as they were in there. And it was, uh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was really awesome. We loved that. So we mentioned before that there was some trouble making this game. But one thing that I've always wondered, and uh, listeners have of too, that we haven't asked any of you guys yet, is uh, you know the, the voice actor strike is still going on. And it started uh, last October, but it was authorized to February before. So it affected any games not started before February of last year. Um, did... Did the strike affect Mass Effect and Andromeda in any way at all? Nope. No effect on Andromeda whatsoever because they had registered the project with the union uh, before that cutoff date. So we just went on and, and got it done. So the game didn't have to have started recording before the strike authorization date. It just only had to have been registered with the union. Correct. Correct. It said, hey, we're doing this project and we're signing on. We, you know, we agree to these terms for this project. Here we go. And when it comes to Bioware, one of the things that we know is uh, one of the challenges is because of the branching dialogues and different emotions you have to display in, you know, in the same scene, um, it's a lot like dubbing where you have to match the lips, match the words and so on because of the way the, the story is, is scripted and moves out. Was this an extra challenge for you? How did you feel doing this type of dialogue? Uh, well, with that, they have a, a really nifty piece of software uh, that, that helps with the workflow on our end as well as theirs. It can take a little getting used to, uh, but I felt like I just rolled into it. It was very natural. And so then with that in mind, what you'll do is you kind of roll through it one way and then you double back and they say, okay, this is the branch if this happens. And you get the lead line, not the audio for it. You know, you can read it. And maybe the director, uh, Josh Dean, I was working with most of the time, would kind of give me a read in of the previous line. And then I had to read the new, you know, the next line once, maybe twice. We'd pick one. Or if we weren't happy with it, we you know uh, do another take or two, and then you just keep rolling through. So, you you really just have your moments before, in any given instance, and you play with that each and every single time. And you're just on your feet because you will you'll go through a combat sequence and then an investigation sequence, and then you're just shouting out or just saying that you found things forty different ways. And then it's a love scene. And then it's a love scene that goes bad. And then you break up with that person. And it's all just in, you know, boom, 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 boom. So the, the technical stuff is kind of keeping it tight. You really got to say those words that are on the screen because those words show up in other languages. Somebody has to dub that. And then it shows up in text because it's all, um, because it's all subtitled. And then there will be performance capture done in Edmonton where they've got their soundstage and actors to do it, and they have those people kind of on call for a while to do all of these uh, uh, cutscenes. And then I have to match that person's timing and performance to a certain extent, but their timing definitely, so that then they can map that under there. So there's like, you know, between that and writers, and there were like two or three different people that were portraying uh, Ryder at different points, 
based on who was available, you know, to do their performance capture. Sometimes there are, there are like five different people kind of creating that moment for a rider or whomever, uh, especially, like I said, in those uh, performance captured cutscenes. Uh, so that was kind of t tricky. You know, you're, you're dubbing to time, not so much lip flaps or anything like that, but saying, ooh, they did that in five seconds. And sometimes that's really tricky because you don't share the same instincts. You know, they, they did it in a certain way that, Ooh, that kind of belies how, you know, Ryder, as we've been performing it, would do it. But okay, let's adapt it. And then one, for a little while, the performance capture Ryder was from Australia. So you're dealing with an accent and just certain elongation of vowels that make things take a little bit more time that would never happen, you know, in American English. So that was, that was fun, too. Um, but I found a lot of times that I would do something and so I would hear the, his, the, the Australian's performance of the, the rider lines and go, yeah, he's right. That's exactly how it is. Let's go. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't change anything from what he did, you know, from his inflection and timing and where he took the pause or something. Because, you know, I, I try to do something different. It's like, okay, well, what's my version? Right? You know, trying to be an artist or something. Mm -hmm. And, oh, what's my version of this? How do, how do I do it? And then I, I would listen to him and go, nope, that's right. He's right. I'm not going to change that. I can't change that. He, he nailed it. So for this game, you never got to wear the, the dots on your face? Nope. No facial capture, things like that, no. Um, I, have, I have done some video sessions here uh, in L.A. where I've had to wear the helmet. Uh, no dots necessary. It's one of those situations where they just shine the really bright LEDs in your face, and they're able to grab the information from that. They don't need the capture points. Uh, so, yeah, none of, that is on, none of that is on Andromeda. That does not say that that won't happen in, like, the next Dragon Age or <laughs> Anthem, but it was not in the pipe. It was not in the tech pipeline for Andromeda. I imagine it made some scenes uh, easier because I know voice actors, not all of them like to be in front of people. And, you know, with some of the, the love scenes and so on, I know Jules DeYoung was saying how it was kind of awkward to watch these things happen with her character and then, you know, have to have to voice them. But at least it wasn't, you know, her having to do them, right? Yeah, yeah. And by the time I saw it, you know, it was they had the 3D models in place and some of it and it wasn't finished. Right. You know, the modelers and the animators were still working on some things. So some of it got really weird and they're phasing into each other's bodies and stuff. And you're just like, well, I'll just use my imagination at this point. How much time, <laughs> you know, how much breathing? Three seconds. And then, OK, OK, let's just make it up. Um, at one point, it was during one of the uh, it was with like a. a uh, the Gill romance path. And as a placeholder for Gill, they had another rider model. So it was two riders like discussing things on a, you know, on a bed and then making out. It's like, yeah, let's see. Okay. You're watching for time. You just created some awfully weird fan fiction right there. Oh yeah. 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 Because it, it is, it's just, it becomes very technical at that point. And you, uh, and you just go. Yeah. Um, I asked to be put in the suit. It's like, hey, yeah, put me in the suit. I'll, I'll act it. And they were like, well, you know, we've got everybody here in Edmonton. I said, I said, well, hey, you know, if we if we get a next one, if we, if we get an Andromeda two or whatever, you know where to find me, and I, you know, happily travel and put on a suit. You know, I I love working with everybody there, and uh, you know, playing the writer character is a great time. And you know, if I could be involved more deeply in it, yeah, that'd be cool. I do hope there's a sequel, or at least. DLC because you know it, it kind of needs to, but I know they established setting them up with uh, some of some of the novels, which also were delayed for some for some reason. Um, are you going to be voicing any of the narration for the upcoming novels? I know Frida did uh, first one. Are you going to be doing any of the other ones? Uh, hopefully, um, the I don't know how much inside baseball on that to use that phrase again uh, that I can discuss there. But what had happened is the publisher that I work with, the wonderful people at Blackstone Audio cut out a deal with Titan Books to uh, do the audio versions of those books. And when the first book came through, Brian Barney at Blackstone uh, looked at it and went, mm, this really needs a female narrator. And he was right. There's just the leads in the, even though it's, you know, third person omniscient, the, the leads were women throughout the whole thing. You know what I mean? You know, Sloan yeah. Kelly and the director and all these, it's like, whoa, we need a woman. And he said, could you ask Frida? Do you think Frida would do it? You know, and I, I said, hey, Frida, I'm going to hand you a job here. <laughs> you know, uh, they just want us. They want us on these books. You know, if not me, they want you based on this. Uh, can we do this? And we made it work. And, and Frida came in and I was outside the booth kind of directing. And that turned out great. She, she, she did a really great job with that narration. So uh, in theory, 
if there are future books and I'm appropriate for it, yeah, that's what the, that's what's going to happen. Um, so I, I, ho I hope so. I would, I, I would love to. I would love to. That's, that was part of the thing when I, I kind of found those books. I found that those were happening, and I talked to Brian Barney at uh, Blackstone Audio and said, Hey, Brian, I can't tell you why, but if we got the audio <laughs> rights to these books and I narrated them, it would be a really cool get. I can't tell you why <laughs> for various reasons, but, you know, because this was back like, you know, this is like last spring or summer, like way before N7 Day or any of this stuff. And I had to say, I can't tell you why. And I know this is a weird conversation, but it would be a cool thing if we made this happen. Yeah, the other two novels they announced are definitely stories that I want to and perhaps need to hear. Well, this one, I was really good in it. Uh, it really helped that there was a voice from the game in there because the other Mass Effect novels and even Dragon Age ones, they didn't really use people from the games. And this one, having that continuity in there really definitely helped uh, expand it in a way that made it a more positive, uh, awesome experience. Yeah, and I thought when I first found the books, I thought, wow, this would be a really great get. I should have more work, but even more so, for lack of a better way of putting it, for, for fan service to say, hey, you know, not only can you, you know, read the book, but you can listen to the audiobook, and it's Scott and Sarah, you know, narrating it. How how cool is that, right? You know, it's a it's just kind of an immersion thing, and it, it was fun. So I'm, yeah, I was really glad that we made that work. Well, you definitely have a skill for audiobooks. There's nothing like getting an audiobook that you really want to hear, and the narrator's voice is just, well, boring. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not for everyone. I mean, even Frida, she, who was really good at it, she's like, yeah, I don't know if I can do another one of these. You know, if, if a video game is a marathon, uh, audiobooks are ultras. They're ultra marathons. And it takes um, takes a lot of fortitude and and love. Like, you really got to care to to do the audiobook stuff. You know, I've got a bunch of balls in the air that I'm trying to keep going, and, uh, and audiobooks have been a big part of it. Um, but it's not it's not as the it's not as much of a be all and end all as it is for some other people in the field who are just, you know, monsters and I absolutely love and look up to their work. So I have some friends who do audible books and uh, I'm just wondering, is it a typical contract to get paid based on how much the book was uh, downloaded or bought? Or what are the contracts like uh, in general for doing audiobooks? There are different contracts uh, in place. I I work with a SAG after contract, and that unless you again unless you work out special deals or something like that is a per finished hour contract. Nice. Meaning, however it takes however long it takes you to record the book, that's your time. Whatever, whatever the length of the finished book is, that is your hourly rate. So it's this much per finished hour. If it's a ten hour long book, that times whatever your rate is. And that's the money you get. Although you can do things through Audible and other things where it's a it's a profit share, where maybe you get a base pay or nothing, and based upon how well the book does, yeah, you get kind of like kind of like royalties from records or something like that. But that really only works in specific books. Or if you know your book is a James Patterson novel and you just it's just going to sell, you know that that works. Uh, a lot of the times, the per finished hour is the better is the better way to go. It, it depends. Like I said, I'm beholden to union agreements, so that's what I go with. And that's how Blackstone works. And I've I've done stuff with Penguin Random House and like one other company, but I've really worked exclusively with Blackstone since like 2011. I'm been I've been really lucky to to work with them. And they're the ones that have like all the um Captain America, Civil War, Marvel uh junior novels and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, they 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 cut a deal with um the, the Marvel Publishing Group a number of years ago, and they had me audition for a couple things that I wound up doing, like the Avengers and the Captain America series, and those are those are really fun to do because I just because then I get to go watch the movies and try to like okay well what's a kind of a version of this you know and try to play with the voices and you know minor you know pseudo impressions for different characters yeah that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I've gotten to hear uh, one of them, and it, it was pretty good. And, you know, I guess some people might complain about, you know, like Chris Evans not being able to do the voice. But really, I know when it comes down to it, uh, you guys were trained voice actors who use their voice all day and read all day can usually do this so much better than an actor who is used to being on set, you know, doing what he does, stepping off, and then, you know, doing it again the next day. You know, it's a very different very different thing. Yeah, that work is a very different kind of uh, uh, uh I want to say a, a different kind of fortitude you know those long days and working on that kind of thing you know i don't know if i could do that 
I, 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 I laugh that you mentioned about that because uh, I was working on something last week and we were knocking out these videos, putting in the VO for this stuff. And um, we blew through like four videos, five videos that was like what was supposed to be the day's work in less than an hour. We just boom, 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 knocked them out. And she said, do you think you have it in you for maybe another three or four? And I said, I do audiobooks. This is a day off. <laughs> you know, coming into somebody else's studio, driving in, I'm staying, it's a beautifully air conditioned space, there's somebody bringing me water, all this, yeah, let's knock out some more videos, you know, and we, you know, we, we blew through like six or seven or, oh, no, 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 it was like, it was like 10 videos, something like that, in that one day, over the course of two hours, um, two, two and a half hours, and I said, and he's like, want to do another, let's go, let's go, come on. <laughs> this this is a break compared to some of the other stuff that I've done. So it was a uh, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, I like getting out. I you know I like getting out of. The, I I like doing the audiobook stuff and working here at home and having that there. But I like getting out. I like you know working with producers and directors and other actors and whatnot. So it's always a it's a combination of those two things. You know, my wife always yells about me when she comes home and I talk to her. She's like, you know, here's the stuff I've done today. She's like, I just got home. Can you give me time to decompress? And it takes a moment for her to go, right, you've been here by yourself all day with the dog, if that. And I talk to her, too. She's she's wonderful. She's a great listener. But yeah, it's always this dichotomy. It's like, all right, let's let's give her a chance to do stuff, and then I'll talk to you about my day. Or not, you know, it's a, it's a strange thing. And there's a lot of that in voiceover and for voice actors that it's very solitary many times, um, depending upon what... Uh, what division of voice acting you're working in. A lot of it's very solitary. So, yes, you run into other people, and it's kind of like this joyous day of running into somebody that you haven't seen in a while because most times you are not, you don't see anybody. I know it's fairly rare, but it and it's more typical with animation, but have you ever had an opportunity to record as a, as a group or with other people in the same room to uh, to do your recording sessions? Um, only for commercials. I've done dialogue for commercials with other people. That's it. Um, I don't have much in the ways of an animation uh, resume. I will admit to that. Uh, working on it, you know, working on it. Um, and so much of everything else, especially video games, is done in a solo situation. I've done some, you know, uh, motion and performance capture for, for high voltage and other places that I was, you know, with a team of people working in a room. Uh, sometimes there was another actor or whatever. Um... But other than that, no, it's very solitary. So yeah, some of the best, some of the best like working with other people conditions I've had were dialogue. Uh, sometimes with just random people, other times with people that I really looked up to, <laughs> which was very surprising. Um, some of those people have gone on to do some amazing, wonderful things. Uh, a buddy of mine, Chris Sullivan, uh, he's on. Um, uh, um, oh, what's that show on NBC? Uh, this is us. So Sully's on that. He was also Taserface in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. And yes, yeah, Sully and I used to do a voiceover and other stuff in Chicago. He's an amazing actor. He's one of those actors that yeah, he's, he's he walks into the room and it's just like, and, and he's just really good. He's got a yeah, great look and all these other things. And then he's really, really good. It's like, it's one, he's one of those guys who comes in and you think, man, I don't have anything for, for you, but I'm going to write something for you. He's, he's, he's fantastic. And he's a great guy to boot. So I'm so I'm so happy that all this other stuff, that all the stuff that's been going on, has been going on for him. He's, he's wonderful. Yeah. So and and working with him on weird voicing dogs for a commercial years and years and years ago, <laughs> you know, is, is it's great. You know, we were both we were at the same agency in Chicago, so we see him all the time. So we've talked a little bit about working with high voltage and video games um, with Conduit in Chicago. Uh, You've also worked with a French company, Ubisoft. You've worked with Bioware, as you mentioned, which is Canadian. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the, the differences people can expect uh, working with different video game companies, especially some of the bigger ones like Ubisoft and Bioware that, you know, have a little more money. Yeah, they had a little bit of money, but there's, you know, for, um, for uh, working with Ubisoft on uh, Watch Dogs, we were in one of the best facilities in Chicago, CRC, Chicago Recording Company. They do a lot of music as well as other just, you know, commercial VO and whatnot, uh, audio as well as video. Uh, or I should say video as well as audio. Um, and then, but, you know, High Voltage had their own facility kind of, you know, tucked in the back corner by the, the audio offices uh, in the Hoffman Estates place. Um, so, you know, never know what to expect. And, of course, uh, most of 
most all, I think with one exception of the uh, Andromeda sessions were done at one of the uh, uh, Formosa interactive spaces uh, in the LA area. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to kind of expect. Um, expect to have nobody else to work with. Expect to work, you know, pretty long hours. Uh, expect to have zero context to what you are doing and performing. So, you know, bring your imagination, bring your improv background, bring your ability to say yes and, you know, go with it. And that, that sense of fun and discovery. Um, bring a vocal health background, support your, you know, voice vocally, things like that. Um, and that's just generally, you could say that for anything, but uh, definitely in video games, because you will be dying at one moment and calling out to somebody at another and then having a romantic sequence uh, someplace, you know, somewhere else, all in the span of, that's 30 minutes. You know, that's the first 30 minutes. And then you've got another three and a half hours of work to go before, before the end of the session. Um, we, I forget the record. If I remember rightly, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be telling this or whatever it is, but I believe, like, Miss Hale has the record for, like, however, how, you know, X number of lines in a session. <laughs> um, and I was always trying to, like, how many, how many lines can we bang through today? You know, how much of the script can we get through? You know, and I was always trying to challenge myself. And a line can be anything from a few sentences, you know, a real thing, to, hey, get down, you know, or... I should get going, you know, that kind of, so some big or small. So some days I felt like I was cheating because we were just going boom, 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 boom. Oh, look at this. Interesting. We could use this. And just, you know, 50 variations of finding some random thing on the ground. Um, so, yeah. Was there a specific question that to it's be prepared more for? Because, you know, with Bioware, you're being remote directed for Canada, Ubisoft there in France. And so the remote director, what are some of the different things like, when they remote direct you, imagine they can't give you as much instruction and much face-to-face -face time. So this tips for dealing with stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's different. When we did when we did, when we did um, uh, Watch Dogs, they brought their audio team and writers down. They realized we're setting it in Chicago. Let's just go to Chicago, right? Um, and I asked uh, later because they brought me in a few different times. They were really cool to work with, and I got to work with Wes Gleason, who's all over like the DC universe right now. I don't know. Yeah. You're just feeling like it. Right. And it's like, I haven't since moving here, it's like two years ago, I've been back and forth with him on Twitter and it's, and I know he's hearing my auditions. He's not used me, which is fine. But I just want to like hang with him again because working with him was awesome and it clicked. And, you know, he talked about his work. I, I talked to him about his work on, you know, with uh, new Vegas and whatnot. Um, and I asked him about how he's directs and how he puts the things together. He's like, I just keep it in my head. And, uh, you know, just, he was awesome to work with. I loved working with him. And I, I love his work and the stuff he's putting together for uh, for Warner Brothers. So th he was there, and the other audio and writers were there from uh, uh, from Ubisoft. So that was all done. It was like over the course of two weeks, they just flew everybody down and just took over Chicago Recording Company, like two or three of the studios there, and just pumped through like 30 to 50 of the best voice actors in Chicago. I, I asked, I was like, could I see who's on the schedule for this week? And it was just this litany of names of friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and others. And I just went, yep, that's the best in town. Wow, this is, you know, this is an amazing group of people that you're having playing, you know, these background citizens and other stuff like that. It was really, really a, an amazing group that they put together. And that just goes to show, too. You know, it's like, I was really fortunate for those people to be my friends and colleagues and peers in Chicago. And so then somebody from out of town, you know, who doesn't necessarily know them or their bodies of work, they auditioned and these people came in and picked them. It's like, yep, good work is good work. Doesn't matter where you're from. And they all, you know, they brought it and they were all worked very hard in that game. I know when it comes to video games, but Bioware especially, you don't really know anything beyond maybe the name of your character before you step into that booth. With how long it took to record Mass Effect Andromeda, did your the approach you took to your character change from the beginning to the uh, in, towards the end when you uh, were a little more loose and more familiar with what to expect? Um, not too much. Um, I think we had we were doing like one maybe two sessions a month 
at the beginning for the first uh, X number of months, and it started to pick up in earlier, uh, early to mid 2016, and then it was just a, a marathon of sessions throughout the latter portion of 2016. But you know, early on there was a there was a portion, uh, some like spring or something like that. I don't remember when, but they had kind of reviewed everything they've got to listen back to see, oh, do we need to change things? Do we need to find a new direction or whatever? And the note that they had was that this was great. You know, they were everybody's happy with where everything was. But as we go forward, really, we're going to try to give you as much context as we can. Keep in mind when in the storyline is Ryder. Is this the inexperienced, doesn't know what he's doing Ryder? Or is this more late game? He's got a bunch of planets under his belt and side missions. And it's you know time to go to work Ryder. So that was something that we had to really be aware of as we went forward and started recording, you know, bits of dialogue all over the game, time-wise. Um, and then how do you place that thought, that direction, when it is a side mission that could be done at any time in the game? I don't know. You know, <laughs> you know, we had to kind of make it up and base it off the writing. It's like, well, you know, what is the, what is the writer kind of saying about writer at this point you know how do i how do i do this how do i do that so you rely on the writer a lot uh or the director kind of to pick up things or my our wonderful engineer uh judy lee who would catch stuff in the text and say i think it's this and we go oh judy's right all right let's record it again to make sure we get it right um so there's a lot of that um but again most of it again is context clues there's either stuff in the writing in the stuff in the software that would tell us you know how this is done, when it's done, and sometimes we just throw in some options and say, here's our A take and here's our B take, you guys choose one. And sometimes we're wrong. And the next day or the next week when we have a session, they'll say, you know, somebody from Quality Assurance would say, hey, we gotta re-record this, you're yelling, and dad's right next to you. Um, and that happened. There were <laughs> some wonderful, wonderful stuff from the early cutscenes in the game where <laughs> Where I'm re-recording it, they said, "What's the cutscene?" They'd play the cutscene, and you know, there's Dad. We've got to get down there and make this thing happen. And it's Dad, where are we going? <laughs> and I'm, and he's physically standing right next to, uh, you know, to Ryder. And it was just, it, it was very fun to watch, and we laughed, we had a good time. And it's because when we recorded that, that was months and months and months ago. We didn't have that context. We didn't know. The only context we had was what was going on like in the environment and the weather, but not, oh, we're standing next to each other talking over, you know, uh, communications gear in our heads, you know, with our headsets. So I, for the first time I played through, I played through as male writer and uh, mostly because, you know, I thought Core was awesome and all this sort of stuff. But uh, I had my favorite scenes from the game. What were some of your favorite scenes to record or most poignant scenes or sequences in the game for you as a, as a voice? That's, um, I don't know. Um, I do like a little bit, uh, just because it's, it's sweet and written that way, um, the, the kind of culmination of, not the relationship, but the culmination of the loyalty mission where, you know, Korra with the, the roses and stuff, where she talks about what she wants to do. Oh, the one with the sand and so on. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes. It's it's a very, it's a very small scene, but it's very personal and poignant, and I think that's what makes this type of game great. Yeah, it was really sweet, especially with all this other stuff like that. And, and Jules knocks it out of the park. That was one of the instances where she had recorded it first before I got to hear it. And I was just like, oh, this is so good. She's so good. You know, she's so great at this. This is wonderful. Um, it made this sequence easy to act. There was that. Um, I remember that one. Uh, the storyline. The the Gil having a kid storyline. Oh, am I, spoil am I spoiling? Yeah. Or, no, do you, know, do you know that one? Yeah, yeah I know that um, like, I played. I, I finished 96% of it. That, that entire storyline I loved um, because it was not about you know, a potential kid's gay dad or any, you know, there's no contemporary baggage in the scene. It's about a guy who's always been kind of a fly by the seat of his pants, you know, person making the very personal, important decision. It's like, I think I want to be responsible for a change, you know? And then if you have a relationship with Gil, him asking for you to be responsible with him, I'm like, this is beautiful. You know, I, I love that. 
that relationship and that sequence. It was it was sweetly written, and I think it was a wonderful thing, you know, for for Gil and for them to and for him to play, and it was really great for me to play. And I and I and said we finished that sequence, and I said I said to Josh Dean who directed uh, a lot of the stuff later on, I said, Hey Josh, could you set up the pipeline? This is my favorite thing, whole game. <laughs> Just because it was written without any contemporary garbage, it was a personal thing for these characters. You know, having that personal moment, those personal thoughts. And it's, again, like I said, it's not about, ooh, gay dads. It's about, ooh, do I want to have this responsibility? Can I do that? And then you as writer being able to maybe discourage it, but also encourage it. And then when you encourage it, say, hey, yeah, do this. And then if you have a relationship with Gil, you turn around and go, you want to be dad with me, <laughs> you know, and having that. And then, of course, for me, I'm also thinking outside of that, I go, oh, my gosh, what does that mean for the next game? You know, what if you've established that? How far in the future does Andromeda 2 happen, if it happens, right? And do we now suddenly have to deal with the fact that it's possible that Scott Ryder is a dad? You know, it's. I was like, wow, you know, there's, suddenly there's a huge branching path there. <laughs> that yeah. could mean that could mean trouble, <laughs> you know, for the next game. But I also thought, oh, but that'd be really cool to write and perform, though. That'd be a really cool branching path. That is one of my biggest hopes uh, for a sequel is, you know, whoever you ended up with, you know, how far can it progress? Can you progress, get married, have kids? Will this potential future games have multiple generations of people the you know it's the potential is is endless and it seems like this is the type of game that actually do it because mass effect one through three there was an urgency a certain timeline that was condensed and uh you, know, you, you really couldn't relax in this but this game you have the time to do it and i think it would be a missed opportunity if they did not do something like that and i look forward to you know seeing how this progresses through time yeah there is i mean there's certain urgency with you know the Corian arc and other things like that but at the same time, you know, you could say, yeah, maybe we don't find that for a time. Or we do, and then what's the, yeah. You could flash forward to something, and everything's settled, and then something awful happens, and, you know, the initiative kind of starts back up again. Or some of the other, like, you know, dad secrets and stuff kind of creep back in to, to everybody's lives, and they say, we have to, you know, re-up the initiative, you know, and, and call Ryder back into action. You know, you figured it out before, you know, Scott and Sarah come out or Scott and Sarah, right? They are both there by the time the first game finishes. And while one has performed as Pathfinder, the other one hasn't. Now you've got a new relationship, right? Are they both present at all times throughout the thing? Or do we have one get kidnapped? <laughs> you know, you know, how do we solve that uh, narratively? So, yeah, there's a lot of really cool threads that, you know, it's about what they want to do in the future. Where do they want to take it? How do they want to write it? And some of these things I'm looking at, I go, wow, that could be a problem. How do we deal with that narratively successfully in a game format? And then just the fans who's a you know very popular fan theory, one that I quite like is, you know, Cora's last name is Harper. So is she related to Jack Harper? Is he the benefactor? Right. And she was an Asari huntress with the biotics. And you know what I mean? It's like, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and, you know. BioWare is a company, you know, working with EA, they've got a lot of irons in the fire right now. We've got the Dragon Age stuff, you know, on the way, and of course Anthem, which I'm I'm juiced for, you know, and it looks Star Wars really stuff cool. Still. Yeah, and so that's the other thing, is that as everybody worries about uh BioWare and, and Mass Effect, uh, you know, one of the things that I think EA is doing as a company is they go, We have some of the best narrative people in the industry over here. And we've got some properties that maybe could use a little narrative help. And that's part of the, you know, not only does EA use Bioware to make like some kind of, you know, uh, like their Oscar winning games, right? You know, Dragon Age and, you know, uh, and Mass Effect and things like that. You know, let's go win some Oscars with our, you know, with, with these experiences. But, you know, we could also use their experience to bring some of that Oscar caliber writing and performing and other things to our other more action-y franchises, you know, um, bring them up a notch. It's like, let's, let's use this stuff. And so uh, that's one of the things that I think is really cool is that, yeah, the, the team is dispersed and I'm still following everybody and what they're doing, but I'm really, I, I, I can't wait to see what else they do and what they, they work on. And then, of course, the multiplayer team is still hard at it, bringing out stuff, you know, every week or two weeks because, man, that combat is good in Andromeda. I really enjoy, I really enjoy just 
trash and dudes. Yeah, and one special thing about Andromeda is, you know, there's they took a lot of people from all over Bioware. You know, there's Mac Walters, who's you know the main guy, but he's from Edmonton. But then you have you know Hal Hood from Bioware Austin, and all these different writers and people came together to to make this. And then you know when it, and you can tell you can tell there's a lot of influence from games like Star Wars: The Old Republic in Andromeda and how the story is told. And uh, you know they they didn't say the series is dead. They said it's on ice. And so I'm assuming what they're doing is saying let's make sure. Anthem comes out and it's what we want. Let's make sure Battlefront comes out and it's what we want. Let's make sure Dragon Age comes out and it's what we want and do it one game at a time to make sure they don't repeat the same mistakes. There's a lot there. There's a lot in the pipe. It may be a while and I hate waiting as much as anybody else, but you know, there's a lot of other stuff in the pipeline and at the end of the day, you know, it's a business. It's all a business. And as much as we try to art our way through all this other stuff, you know, we got to be mindful of those of those businesses things. So it's all business. And I miss playing with everybody. I miss all that stuff. I miss Josh. I miss Judy. I miss uh, Caroline. Every all, you know, um, you know, the, the back and forth. But I, I keep up with all of the writers and everybody online. And it's it's it was a treat. And it's it's I still look at it as a treat. And like I said, I. I I'm, I'm, I moved to Los Angeles, uh, to the LA area late in May of 2015, and by early August 2015, suddenly I'm in a Mass Effect game. It, it, I mean, it, it blew my mind. Just absolute, absolute treat. And uh, I, I, I said it to them back when I had a first session, and I said it last session, you know, thank you. And, and thank you for playing, and all the other fans for listening and enjoying it. Um, it was a treat. And I hope we get to, you know, play again soon. And perhaps instead of, you know, DLC or, you know, sequel, they might get the third ever Bioware expansion. You know, the first being with Baldur's Gate and, and Baldur's Gate 2 and, uh, I guess, fourth. And then uh, the next one being with Dragon Age. Different stuff, yeah, yeah. So my last question before we wrap up, and it, if we can have a bumper right afterwards so we can continue promoting this, but, you know, uh, where can people find you online if you want to ask you more questions, continue you're seeing or tracking your stuff, seeing what you're up to? Sure, I'm always follow uh, followable on the Twitter. Uh, that's at Taylorson, and I do have a Facebook page. I think it's Tom Taylorson Voice Actor. Uh, so Facebook.com/slash you know, Tom Taylorson Voice Actor, or just search for Tom Taylorson Voice Actor on Facebook, and you can follow things there. Twitter is more day to day um, and kind of quick fire stuff, and the Facebook has a lot more. Excuse me, a lot more um, uh, audiobook stuff. Just because of demographics and splits and things like that, I find the audiobook stuff plays better on Facebook. And those are the major places. Uh, my website, TomTaylorson.com, needs a lot of help <laughs> and updating. There's been a lot going on the past couple of years, and that, that's, you know, fallen to the wayside as we've tried to establish ourselves out here in California. But, uh, yeah, so at Taylorson and uh, Facebook if you're so inclined. And I look forward to seeing what Bioware does with you next, because one thing we do know, they're very loyal to their voices. I've asked them. <laughs> Need a red shirt, guys? No? no? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I, and I love my time working with them. They were just, ah, just a treat. Just an absolute treat. Well, thank you so much for being on with us and sharing all these uh, cool stories and so on. And, you know, just one thing on your website, you have some of your ads up there. And I have to say, listening to some of those uh, blockbuster ads that you did, it's just kind of sad. Kind of sad. Wasn't that something? Yeah, that was uh, to do another small story that was like a series of ads it was a very good like job like little payday thing but it was the last like dying it was the death row ad campaign that was the last ad campaign before blockbuster went so it's like hey you're the voice of yay oh <laughs> and, and, it, and it's over and the you know and if you can still find those th those were good ads those were really good spots interestingly enough i'm from alaska where the last eight blockbusters still are well not anymore they j literally just closed like last week so uh cheap dvds for everyone there uh, that's what they did and now uh those bumpers you know so you just like one with just you um talking about like, some of the roles you played and then one as a uh, scout writer so uh let's uh let's do this okay <clears throat> Hi, I'm Tom Taylorson, the voice of Scott Ryder in Mass Effect Andromeda. And, and you're listening to Bomb Bad Radio. Hey, this is Pathfinder Scott Ryder, and you're listening to Bomb Bad Radio, my favorite podcast on the Nexus.
Yeah, Andromeda is not as easy to do these with as uh, the original ones. We had, you know, Mark Mir and uh, Jennifer Hale and so on. They did their, there is, you know, hey, this is Commander Shepard. It's my favorite so and so on the on the Citadel. It's much easier with that one. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, we made that joke during the during sessions. It's like, can we do we have a version? No, we didn't. Just to put down in a quick perspective, uh, Jennifer Hale was actually the first. Or one of the very first guests we ever had on a podcast and we interviewed her I interviewed her the day the Mass Effect 3 came out and I just got a message from her that says I'm ready to available now and I'm like oh okay okay I'll do I'll do this I'll do this right now I'm gonna stop playing your game and I got to interview her uh, the day of and it was awesome that's awesome yeah I um uh, you know it, I believe I believe the record they told me like I said I can't I, I don't know because I don't know if it's official or unofficial or whatever like that I didn't want to get into it but the record that they told me was like 524 or 526 that's how many lines Jen Hale knocked out in one day in a four-hour session during Mass Effect 3 and just so we can put that into a nice comparison what is an average day for for most people on a project like this they want 300 to 350 my best day i have it written down somewhere was likely 482 and i don't know if they had it in place for mass effect 3 but that means see right now they have a very special piece of software that makes things go a lot more quickly and smoothly i think they were still working with paper during mass effect 3. yes so i'm like i don't know if this can be done and it was late in the process too so they were just knocking lines out it was three games in. She knew Shepard backwards and forwards. How, you know what I mean? It was so set. And so with, and I, so that was always in the back of my mind. It's like, you know, how quickly can I get to that space? You know, how quickly can I get there? And, and we got there. We got, we, we did a pretty darn good job by the end there. So I'd like, I'd, I'd love another swing at that record.